I'd like to uh, welcome alumni from across the globe. I'd also like to welcome our special guest, WPI President Laurie Leshen. Um, with all we've experienced with the last few months, uh, I hope that this meeting finds you safe and healthy. Um, our board and committees have been working remotely to bring our business to this annual meeting. And we have a short business meeting before the keynote address, which I'm sure that everybody is excited to hear. Um, the first order of business for the annual meeting is to approve the minutes of last year's annual meeting, which were posted for review on our website. And may I have a motion to accept the minutes? I move to, I move to accept, accept the minutes. The minutes. Second? Second. And uh, now we'll need a vote. And the yeas have it. Uh, the meetings from last year have passed. Um, now I'll turn the meeting over to Dan Sullivan from the proud class of 2012, the Alumni Association Treasurer. Hey everybody. So this year's financials uh, were also posted for your review, but I'll highlight a few points. Uh, in general, revenue this year is projected to be about $170,000 and expenses at about $150,000, resulting in a net income of about $20,000. Over 70% of our revenue comes from interest earned from our invested funds that the association has accrued over a long history. As for expenses this year, the Alumni Association supported WPI students through over $90,000 in scholarship funds and several student and alumni events, such as our freshman welcome event, the Student Alumni Society events and programs, homecoming, uh, the women of WPI, or an alumni group that get together and put on programming as well, and several more groups. Um, when we consider the impact of the of COVID-19 uh, that impacts everybody, our revenue will be impacted by, a, a, by the stock market downturn, but not by any changes in enrollment or anything else going on at the school. Our finances are um, not fully independent, but separate from that. And uh, several events were canceled through DTERM in the summer, so we didn't spend as much as we expected, which is how we end up with uh, $20,000 net income despite the, um, the COVID-19 situation. So um, our, our financials are not super complicated, but Mark, uh, in a moment, will speak more about some of our more significant investments. Um, but in general, we feel confident the association is in a good financial position. Uh, may I have a motion to accept the financial report? Mark, you're on mute. I can see you're excited to make that motion for me. I am, motion to accept. Is there a second? Second. All, right, All in favor? Yeah, I think we're gonna need a vote. Handle the vote here. I think that will be coming up. Okay, looks like we're all set. Financial report uh, passes. And I'll turn the program over to Dave Wheeler, who is the nominating committee chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. Uh, the nominating committee report was posted online uh, just now for your review. Um, I'd like to thank Mike Shore, class of 92, for his two terms of service on the board. Um, I'd like to offer the following nominations. Uh, Dan Sullivan, who we just heard from uh, class of 12 for tre treasurer. Uh, it's a one year term, so we renominate Dan uh, every year until he runs away and refuses to talk to us anymore. Um, we would like to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Alex Forte, uh, class of nine and 10 for a second three year term. Uh, Miles Walton, class of 97, past president as a representative to the funds board, which is also a one-year term. And Kevin Fitzpatrick, class of 90, as a new member uh, to replace Mike Shore for his first three-year term. 
Could I have a motion to uh, elect the above alumni? I move to elect the above alumni. And I'll second. A vote, Jen. And I guess we'll have a vote now. Let me have that come up. Well, we have uh, some background noise here, I apologize. Uh, thank you for uh, approving the slate of candidates. And um, I'd like to turn this o turn us now over to Pamela Lynch, class of five, who has chaired the bylaw review committee um, in our effort to modernize the governance of the Alumni Association. Thank you so much, Dave. All right, um, so next slide, please. Uh, so the proposed revisions were posted online for several weeks now, and they were approved by the association board at its last meeting in April. We've been working on this almost all year, so I really appreciate the hard work of the committee. Uh, Paula, Catherine, Jane, Rachel, Dave, Peter, and Jen. And I also want to thank the WPI alumni board for their support and thorough vetting, uh, feedback, recommendations to get us to this point. Next slide, please. So the changes are in three categories. And one of them is around kind of language changes. So spelling, punctuation, grammar, a couple of things to clean up. The second is around using the word may instead of shall in regards to the alumni council, which has not been in effect for about 20 years now but it does leave it open for there to be an alumni uh, council, advisory council in the future. And then the third is the committee known as the funds board, which when we look at what's actually being done now, it's the trustees subcommittee on lifetime engagement. So we made sure that our bylaws represent the practice that's actually in effect. And here's another slide of outline revisions. So if you didn't get a chance to take a look at it, this notes the constitution and bylaws and some of the different clarifications. Uh, at the end of the day, we wanted to make sure we're in line with uh, the law, um, current practices, the, the strategy of WPI, and we're fo following our bylaws as they are today. All right, so thank you very much. May I have a motion to accept these revisions? And we're doing all the revisions together, so it will be one motion for the entire revisions. I'd like to move to accept the bylaw revision. Second. Okay. All thank in you. favor, I guess we'll have a vote now. Coming up. Thank you much. Thank you very much, everyone. We appreciate uh, all the hard work that went into this. It looks like the bylaws revision has passed. And so thank you, Mark. I'll turn uh, the program back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Pamela. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you, David, for uh, your reports. Um, and I'd like to take a, a short moment um, to just explain a little bit about what we do. And uh, the, the association is a separate nonprofit from WPI. And it's my pleasure to work with the association members to be able to provide support to WPI, its alumni, and its students. We initiated Tech Connect to keep the alumni community in touch and supporting each other with mentoring and employment opportunities. We also partnered with WPI to establish the Alumni Center at Higgins House, which we hope to bring online when it is safe to do so. We will continue to support the university, its students, and alumni groups through sponsorships and scholarship. This past year, we gave $141,958. And I have a check to present to Laurie 
representing our support this year. So um, awesome. this, this could be us starting a new trend called the virtual check transfer. So here we go. I'm going to bring out the check. Okay. And, wow. one. and okay. here it comes. Okay. Okay. Oh, I got it. Oh. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. I got it. All right. Yes. Look at that. I always love the big check. The big check is one of my favorite parts of all this. <laughs> and uh, somebody brought it, somebody in a mask brought it by to me today. So <laughs> thank you so much. Your support is um, extraordinary and so deeply appreciated. Thanks to all the alumni. Thank you. And um, we, we are ready to go um, and hand over the mic to President Leshen. Uh, one thing that we do have to do is um, close the meeting. Um, so uh, do I have a motion? I move to close the meeting. Seconded, Mark. All right. Um, all in favor? I. <laughs> we have participants raised hands. Oh. Okay. All right. So over to me. Oh, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Mark, and, and thank you to the Alumni Association Board and, uh, and so many others for the work you're doing in support of WPI. Normally, I would be giving this address at Alumni Weekend on Saturday morning with yummy breakfast and, um, and lots of returning alumni in attendance. And I'm thrilled to see 200 people on the phone with us here or on the Zoom with us today. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a different kind of a talk than my normal state of the Institute sort of address, just because so much of our energy is focused right now. Could you go back once? Thanks. Um, on, uh, on a couple of really big issues. And, and I just wanna spend some time talking about those and sharing some updates around our thinking about what's coming next in the fall. Um, I will say that as I sit here this evening, I am coming to you from Boyden Hall. I am in my office on the campus. This is a big week for me after about three months of working almost entirely remotely. I am back in the office these last couple of days. I will say, I don't know that there's anyone else in the building with me right now, but, um, but slowly but surely we are working on, and I'll talk to you a little bit more about um, our return to campus. The Commonwealth is reopening and we are working on reopening here at WPI as well. Um, so yes, I'm here in Boynton Hall. I've got my, my Earth and my Mars. I've got my planets here. I've got my Origampi. Origami Gompi. I've got, you know, all my fun things back here with me. I'm, I'm so happy to be back here on the hill and look forward to in the months ahead, hopefully uh, welcoming the rest of other folks back to the hill as well. Um, let me just say that uh, what I'm going to do now is, is show a few slides. They mostly don't have words on them, but I'll talk to you some about kind of things happening here on the campus as I always do. In order to do the Q&A in this webinar feature of Zoom, we have a Q&A box, not the chat box if you're a Zoom person, but actually the Q&A box. You can type your questions in the Q&A box anytime. Everybody can see everybody's questions. Uh, and then um, after I get done speaking, we'll, um, I think Peter Thomas is going to go through those questions and ask as many of them as he can, and I will answer as many of them as I can. And those that we don't answer, we'll try and get back to you separately. Uh, but again, we, we go until about seven here, so I'm happy to engage with you in, in Q&A and conversation. Um, okay, but so I'm going to talk really about two big topics tonight. Um, one is about returning to campus and, and COVID-19 and sort of the impact on our community and all of the planning. And honestly, this is taking up, you know, essentially all of uh, um, our time. Um, but in addition now, we, we have had, um, I, I feel like I really want to and need to address an additional issue. And Jen, if you could just go to the next slide for me. Uh, before we start talking about COVID, before we talk about bringing students back to campus, I just want to talk about uh, the moment that we find ourselves in as a nation, as a planet, 
Um, it's really unprecedented in so many different ways, but one of those is just acknowledging that our nation, especially, is, is in a moment of extraordinary turmoil as we are really, I, I hope, very seriously reckoning with centuries of systemic racial discrimination. Um, this particular photo, by the way, was taken right here in Worcester, uh, where last week more than a thousand people gathered peacefully uh, in protest right down at the Worcester Common. And look at that, they're all wearing masks. That's very good. They get points for that. Um, and, and look, I just want to say very clearly that I believe and WPI believes that Black Lives Matter. I share the anger and the outrage that is being peacefully expressed through these um, marches and protests. And, um, you know, I already sent a message to the community restating our values um, and, and stating that we stand with those who are outraged in this moment and we stand with those who want to make positive change um, to increase racial justice in the world. But that's not enough. We, um, we must and will take action. So statements of value are necessary but not sufficient in this moment and we need to take action. We're not done. And I just want to acknowledge that um, alumni have already played a really important role in the actions that we will be talking about. I'll be sharing a little bit more about that in a second. But I also want to let you all know that yesterday, which was a day that um, on social media was called, you know, shut down STEM, where there was a real push to have um, STEM professionals, you know, not do their normal work, spend the day, um, or their, you know, not do their lab work or whatever they might have been planning that day spend at least a part of the day in, in serious reflections on the changes that are needed in our system so that it can become more racially just. We have a lot of work to do in STEM to become more racially just. And, um, and so many people on our campus participated in that yesterday. I have been spending time each and every day doing that reflection and engaging with members of our community as we are putting together what our next steps are. And so you will hear more from us in the days and weeks ahead on the topic of racial, racial justice. I think um, there are, and I'll just speak very honestly with you all, there, there's a lot of energy around having a plan, very concrete actions to take quickly. And I completely get that. And by the way, I share it, that's my inclination as well. But I think in this moment, you know, taking the time to really be thoughtful and get input from a lot of folks um, as we put our action plans together is really critical. And then we're going to have to keep iterating on that too as we, as, we, um, as we work together, as we come back together as a community in the fall. So, um, and, and as, I, as I start to transition to talk more about the input that we've already, the wonderful input that we've received from a group of alumni, I just want to acknowledge directly that there are undoubtedly people on this call who experienced discrimination and racism while they were students at WPI, or perhaps even as alums of WPI. And I just want to address them directly and say, I am sorry. I am sorry about the fact that that happened. I am sorry we have not done more to acknowledge racism that it exists at WPI and that we've not done more to eradicate it. We need to do better. And if I have anything to say about it, we will do better. We've got to be willing to come together to take a hard look at who we are, at our culture, at the culture of STEM, at the culture of, of, of institutions of higher learning, and, and be willing to do a bunch of hard work together. And, and I'm, I'm energized by the, the possibility of that work. I'm energized by the movement that people have started here. And I, I hope others, um, others share for that commitment and, and our alumni are a wonderful group to start with to, to continue to really work to make WPI better. At, at, the, at the very least, you're a great group of folks to keep, to hold us on this campus accountable for continuing to make progress. So I appreciate that. And, and our alums are starting to drive this. Um, I know Layla Thompson is on the call today. I met with her earlier this week. If you could go to the next slide, Jen. Um, and there is, and many of you I'm sure have seen on various social media outlets, a letter and, a, and an input from a group of alumni that I think was about 175 alumni signed on to it. And those are alumni, black and brown alumni, alumni of color, also 
um, majority alumni. And, and I think it's great that we're having a lot of different people come together in support of actions that we can take. So I pulled this slide with Layla's permission from a slide deck that she shared with me on Monday that um, came from a conversation she had with a group, um, she led with a group of alumni over the weekend and that, which had inputs from a lot of different people. Um, and on this uh, slide are actions that they're requesting that we take very much in the near term immediately, as well as some recognition that we can't, that this is obviously a longstanding problem and it's a problem that goes beyond WPI, but that, um, uh, but that we've got you know, more work to do in the longer term. And so there's some intermediate actions here. And then of course there are many longer term ones as well. So I, I'm not gonna walk through this in detail, but what I can say is almost essentially everything on the immediate list we are going to do. I, the only one that's on here that I cannot absolutely commit to is the one that's about curriculum and syllabi. That is not as powerful as I am as president. I cannot actually tell faculty what to put in their curriculum and on their syllabi, but we can work with them to do so. And so, again, we will be um, collaborating across different campus communities to do these, this kind of work. But I'll just make a couple of comments on this. Transparency on campus statistics, I think, is a great one. We have a lot of data. We have a lot of statistics. I, I, um, I'm thinking about actually this as an IQP for the, for the next year to have a student group come together and work with a group of us. I may even advise the IQP to, uh, to put together the right kind of, um, of statistics and make sure that we're addressing the, the, you know, what would be most useful for people to be able to look at regularly. Um, diversity and anti-racism training for everyone is something that I absolutely will commit to. Campus police, I will tell you, have already done extensive de-escalation and bias training because they are, um, um, they are an accredited police force, which is, um, you know, sort of the highest professional level of attainment that, um, uh, that they can receive. That's something that's recent, probably has happened since most of you graduated from WPI. But nonetheless, we are working with the police chief to continue to, um, to work on the training for our um, safety officers and, and uh, and will continue to work to make their work more transparent. So again, uh, you know, I won't again walk down the entire list, but I am telling you that that I don't see anything on this list that I would say is a bad idea, or I would say it's something we shouldn't do. And and even, and on the intermediate list, I completely agree with that with those things as well, especially around more black faculty, more diverse board of directors. Can I share one piece of great news with? This group will be putting out a release about this soon, but at, at their May board meeting, um, the board did vote, and so this was early May, to add an additional board member, as they often do at their May meeting, starting um, for next year. And so if, if folks wish to, they could Google Pamela McCauley, no relation to Mark, Pamela McCauley, um, if, you, if you Google Pamela McCauley UCF, so she's a professor at University of Central Florida, UCF. She's joining our board, fabulous African-American woman um, who is a biomechanical engineer and has been running innovation programs at the National Science Foundation for the past couple of years and is about to go become an associate dean at, at North Carolina State University. She is amazing and she's going to bring great academic expertise to our board and uh, I could not be more thrilled to have her. So we're already taking action there. It's, it's been a goal of mine. Um, since arriving to continue to work to diversify our board with more work to do. Um, moving um, our Office of Multicultural Affairs closer to campus. I love this idea. Actually, I'm really glad you raised it. And obviously, it's going to take us a little time to figure that out. But I think it, I think it could be possible. So I, I'm excited to pursue these things. So bottom line is, thank you for providing very specific um, inputs and thoughts about things we can do. Here's what I would say. I could do every single one of these things and I still worry it's not enough. So I think we've got, you know, as much as we want to do to take, um, you know, all of these actions, I think we've got to really work hard to unpack the, the cultural and systemic barriers um, that exist at WPI and, and in many, many institutions of higher education, by the way, and many, many STEM institutions. But, but, but 
I care about us. So let's let we've got to unpack that stuff. And that's what I'm struggling to really figure out. How do we how do we go about that? How do we how do we do it better? Some of these forms for conversations and reporting and things like that will help. But I think I think we've got to start by really facing up to the fact that we have some cultural challenges here. And the fact that so many of our black and brown alums were willing to tell their stories in the letter makes a huge difference. And I would love to collect even more of those stories so that we can really begin to make real um, the struggles that people have faced on this campus. So uh, I don't know for sure that that's answering everybody's questions. We will be out with more communications about this. But again, I just want to give a special thank you to Layla, to the alumni group that has supported this work, and to the Alumni Association for making room for this conversation too. Um, so um, moving on from this particular part of the conversation, again, we can come back in the Q&A. I see some, um, some questions about it. We'll come back to that. Can I get the next slide, please? So as we are working on our community, broadly speaking, and then specifically around the COVID-19 response and issues associated with that, I wanted to share with you a slide that I share at every single town hall meeting I have had. And by the way, I have a lot of them now. We've been doing town hall meetings with employees, with faculty and staff every two or three weeks since March. We almost always have between, well, today we had about 600 people at the one I did this afternoon. That's actually a low mark. It's usually seven or 800, but a lot of the faculty are off for the summer now. So um, we've had consistently seven or 800 people at our employee town halls. We have 1,200 employees here. So you can see like three quarters of them are routinely showing up. Today and yesterday, I also had town hall meetings with students. Uh, yesterday was returning students and parents where we had 1,000 people tune in. Today was new students and parents where we had 600 people tune in. So it really has been an extraordinary um, moment to uh, engage people. And I want them to know what's guiding our thinking. And so this North Star is real. In this moment, it's really about keeping our community safe and healthy. It's about serving our students in these unprecedented times, making sure they're able to advance their educational goals. It's about supporting our faculty in their efforts to do that at them delivering on our educational research missions now, it's more important than ever. And they did an amazing job doing a very quick pivot to remote learning for D-term and are really gearing up for highly flexible learning for fall. Keeping our WPI family together. What that's about is unlike lots and lots of universities out there, we have not done bunches, we have not done layoffs, we have not done um, involuntary furloughs. We have not done any of that. We've really managed, even though we refunded $7 million of room and board money in D-term for the students who we had to unfortunately send home. Um, we've been able to keep our WPI family together and we're continuing to do everything we can to make that happen um, in the fall. Treating everyone with great care and respect is about the fact that as I'm sure you all are all experiencing, this new world of remote living and working and and zooming and um, with kids in the basement or kids in the background is a time when we are all um, stressed and on edge and scared and families have been actually directly impacted. Two members of my own team have lost parents to COVID. So it's, it's a real impact. And so it's very important that we do everything we can to treat each other with great care and great respect in these moments. Go easier on each other than we, than we initially feel like you're doing. We talk about that a lot. And then serving our broader community as much as we can. This is a lot about WPI, but it's about more than WPI. And I think you all are aware of the great efforts that have gone in. Um, mask, whether that's mask making, our, our faculty and staff have made over a thousand masks, especially at the beginning of this, that uh, where, where PPE was desperately needed. We gave away pallets and pallets of PPE from our labs to the point where we're having to restock everything now, but we gave it away. We knew it was needed. We said, here, come take it. We wrapped little gumpy goats in it. Uh, and one of our alums wrote to me that he was working in the MEMA in the Mass Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency um, warehouse where all the PPE was being processed. And he came across our pallets with the little WPI goats in there and was so proud and happy. So we're doing all we can to serve our communities beyond WPI as well. Um, next slide, please. 
So just a bit on, on how this all went. So we zoomed through D-Term and uh, it was amazing. I think in the first couple of days or something, there were like a million person minutes of Zoom calls in the first couple of days of D-Term classes. We delivered, over, we, deliver, we delivered on 600 courses and projects in D-Term remotely, amazing. Uh, faculty were incredible. We um, also had student life in D-Term. So this Zoom picture is actually of uh, the Student Government Association um, at, at one of their meetings, which looks way more fun than most of my meetings, actually. I, I think I should probably go back and join SGA. For those of you alums who are alums of SGA, you should be very proud. They're doing amazing work and still supporting student clubs and organizations, making sure students have the information they need. They've been great partners to us. Next slide. Um, and it was, again, more than academic. So our clubs continued. We have a Lego club on campus these days. Here's my Lego Sally ride, by the way. She also stays here with me every day. She's my hero. Uh, and uh, we had a Lego club that was wanting to make a scale model of the entire campus in Legos when we were all together. Obviously, that was not something they could do when we're, they were flung home and apart, but um, they did continue to meet and continue to um, work. And this is a, a CAD, a Lego CAD model or something like that of the quad, as I'm sure you all recognize, which now is ready to be built in actual Legos when, when they come back together. So that's... That's, I just thought that was cool. And speaking of building, uh, the next slide. Uh, we're building a new one. I always talk at this updated um, to the alumni about updates on building progress on the campus. This is our new academic building. You can see exactly where it is coming up the hill next to the Gordon Library. Again, it's our sort of focused on smart world technologies, robotics, engineering, uh, data science, cybersecurity, things like that. Um, Internet of Things, very interdisciplinary building. No one department will have space in this building. It's all going to be academic programs, although technically that's no longer true because I think we're making, we just made robotics into a department and they're going to be in there. So, okay, robotics will be in there. Highly interdisciplinary and, and huge progress. We, we, we did shut this, slow this down, I guess I would say, um, the building during the peak of the COVID outbreak, but, but, um, but that's back in full force now, um, construction on the campus. Next slide. And here are the latest members of your association. Um, our latest alumni, the great class of 2020 has completed. This is their baby picture. I like to look at this as a proud mom. This was when they were first year students back in 2016. We took this group picture of them, um, but they have graduated now and uh, we're incredibly proud of the work that they have done during their four years here. And in fact, on the next slide, you can see that we have um, sent them, we're sending them. This was actually just from a couple of days ago. These are our wonderful staff from the registrar's office. Their diplomas are, go are gonna be in the mail on their way to them um, in the next couple of days, along with some goodies, a little special goat and some other things. And I just previewed the cool video they're gonna get a QR code for. Um, that is, uh, that's uh, tons of people from the campus saying congratulations to them. I'm incredibly proud of this. You can see the numbers here, almost 2,000 graduates over the course of the last year. Incredibly proud of that work and, and many more members for all of you to engage. And then as we get to the to uh, next year, it starts with incoming class. So for us, I, mean, I just have a couple more slides. I want to talk a bit about fall planning here. So first and foremost, we need to bring in this class, the great class of 2024. And yes, I feel old when I say that. They have um, all signed up. We've got, uh, we brought in the class. We were aiming for a class of about 1300 freshmen. And we have above that right now. We always get some melt in the summer, but the um, admissions team did an extraordinary job under unbelievably difficult circumstances. We shifted all of our visiting days to online and they did amazing virtual visits for for students and uh, incredible job bringing in this incredibly talented class and we've sent them all lawn signs and t-shirts and we're keeping them really really engaged um, over the summer we just opened freshman registration for them yesterday and as of last night a thousand of them had already registered so incredible they're very very engaged as i said so we're incredibly proud of this class and, uh, and we're continuing the tradition of bringing, you know, wonderful, highly qualified um, 
uh, students to campus uh, to continue the great tradition of WPI alumni through the years. And then on my last slide, I just will talk a bit more about the planning for fall. I, again, I have millions of word slides about this, but I just didn't want to do that to all of you. So we will, um, obviously we've been in remote operations on the campus since mid-March. We have had a, a couple of 300 employees who were designated as sort of emergency responders, whether they're people caring for our buildings or our grounds or um, campus safety or the several hundred students who actually remained on campus because they did not have safe other places to go. Um, and so we've made sure that we've kept the, the campus in good shape for everybody so that when the time was right, we could begin to welcome them back. As many of you know, the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is going through a phased reopening process. And I was honored to be appointed by Governor Baker to serve on their reopening advisory board, a 17 member board. We worked like crazy for three weeks to come up with uh, the phased approach and what was in each phase and to listen to more than 75 groups, whether they be community groups or industry groups on the idea of reopening Massachusetts. The, um, that plan was released on May 18th and the first phase began on that day. So the first phase of reopening. At the same time, I was involved in helping make the plan for reopening all of Massachusetts. I um, was also leading an effort across the state in higher ed to have a plan for reopening higher ed that's synced up to the state's plan. I hope that makes sense. So we're looking at the whole state, but also looking at all of higher ed in the state. So we, um, so again, this has been a real honor. It's been a lot of work, but we have a phased plan for reopening higher ed in general, where say in the first phase, our research labs could reopen. So on campus, we are in the process of reopening our research labs now about almost 40 PIs have gotten permission with detailed plans to reopen their research labs and they and their graduate students are starting to come back in a phased and thoughtful and careful and very safe way. And we'll have to see more of that over the coming weeks. Next to come back needs to be our faculty and staff. And so today at the town hall, mere three hours ago, I talked about the phased return and reopening of offices. Again, each office will have its own plan. We're working to support people in creating those. Many people can continue to work from home for quite a while, but some people need to get back on campus and, and help us get ready for the fall. And then for the students, um, we've said we will make an announcement about whether we will invite the students back. We'll make that announcement on July 1. But right now what I can tell you is we are planning as if that's the case. We, we, we are making incredibly detailed plans to bring students back to whether that's to de-densify classrooms um, and think about more blended learning styles where certain parts of learning are done um, remotely even if students are on campus and so that we can make sure we preserve the in-person time for labs and projects and discussion sections where, where students really benefit from and need that hands-on and face-to-face -face work. We're, we're de-densifying the residence halls. Those of you that know that we have a lot of triples in our first year residence hall, we will not have a lot of triples this year in the first year residence hall. We're working on all of that now. We're working on all the plans around thinking about um, events and how we'll be able to make the student experience good while we will have real safety protocols in place. And I think I cannot emphasize this enough. The only way we will be able to reopen in the fall is if I am confident, if we are confident that we have good safety protocols in place and we're confident that people are gonna buy into those and be part of the community that comes together to make those work, whether that's um, mask wearing. And by the way, here's a nice one. This, um, uh, the parent of a first year student sent this to me uh, unsolicited. She said she was making them for her daughter and she sent them to me. So there's my goat mask. So mask wearing will be needed. Distance, keeping your distance will be needed. Um, lots of hand washing and hand sanitizer, enhanced cleaning protocols. All those things are so important. You all are smart. You know the science. We need to drive down the rate of transmission of this virus. And that is how you do it. These masks, I get people don't like them. They work. It works. We got to do it if we want to be back together. Um, and then we'll also have testing protocols in place. And we will be testing everybody for a bit. Uh, for at least at the beginning and perhaps even throughout the first couple of terms. We'll see how all that goes as we bring the campus back together. 
So we, we have a, a lot of planning going on. We're doing that planning through something we're calling the CERT, the Coronavirus Emergency Response Team, which touches every corner of the campus community as we try and bring together the best thinking and the best planning to, to do all we can to be able to be open in the fall. And to do so in a way, and what I, my tagline for this is it's driven by science, but it's engineered for WPI. We understand that WPI education is about hands-on learning and we've got to figure out, we've got to convince ourselves that we can do that and do it safely. And that's what we're really working towards. And everyone on this campus from the faculty to the staff um, have, have a stake in this and have a stake in doing it well. And then have a stake in doing it in a way that's going to make all of us proud and I hope make all of you proud. That's always my greatest goal at WPI is to make our alumni proud and um, I will continue to strive for that. So with that, um, it's an exciting time on the campus, stressful for sure. Stay tuned for July 1 with the, with the big announcement about fall. But in the meantime, I'm, I'm happy to take some questions and happy to, um, to be in discussion with you all. And again, thank you for your support of our community, of our students. Um, thank you for the big check. Thank you for all you do as alumni. And please do hold us accountable to do this well, both uh, our work on uh, increasing racial justice on our campus, as well as our work on making sure we're able to deliver on the WPI promise in a safe and effective way. So thanks. Right, Peter, Laurie, can you uh, help me with, with questions? Absolutely. The first question uh, we have, Lori, is can you uh, please speak to anti-racism tolerance training for the faculty, staff, RAs, and PAs? What has been done and what more can be done and when? Yeah, so we have had, so I'm not sure I'm, I'm gonna be able to answer the what has been done accurately. I know that for students, and if others are on the call who can answer, they should feel free, but I know that for students we have had, um, you know, some mandatory training around this. And for faculty and staff, we've also done um, trainings, although I'm not certain they've been mandatory for all faculty. I think that has got to change as we go forward. And the great news is there's more and more resources out there available. What I will say is when I arrived at WPI, we never had a, a chief diversity officer. We had not sort of had an office of diversity and inclusion. And, and we have fundamentally transformed our human resources office to be an office of talent and inclusion. I very much believe that the two things go hand in hand. We hired Michelle Jones Johnson as our chief diversity officer and our head of talent and inclusion. And she has built an office of diversity and inclusion. Um, our um, office of multicultural affairs is, is now a part of that. And professor Tiffany Butler, who is our um, wonderful lead for the office of multicultural affairs is now um, heavily engaged in this work. So I personally think we have more work to do on this front to make sure that we're it's not even just training. I feel like we have to create these forums for conversation and for engagement. I will say when I was at NASA, we had a wonderful program that, you know, people in sort of groups of 20, and it wasn't a one and done. You, over the course of several months, had lots of meetings with this group, and it was, it really created this culture around understanding the importance of, um, of, of uh, anti-racism activities, of inclusion activities, and of building a culture that we all want. And I think we need something of a much greater scale than what I would call sort of the normal training module stuff. So I'm kind of excited to figure out what that needs to be. Thank, thank you, Lori. Um, the next question is, what is your vision for Black slash African American students going forward? What's my vision for numbers or for, I mean, my vision is that they are able to thrive at WPI and that we need to dramatically increase the numbers. Um, and that no one on this campus should experience um, racial bias or racism in the way that I've been hearing that many of our alumni had to experience. And so that's my vision, my aspiration. Uh, now it's a matter of, of how do we make that a reality? And by the way, if this was easy, it it would have been done by now. So I think we have to acknowledge that it's gonna take time. Um, I do think uh, in terms of recruiting, and, and again, just to get, uh, I don't think this is only a numbers game, but I think the numbers help. So we have been working, as I think you all know, to diversify our incoming student body. We've had way more success with women than we've had with students of color um, and underrepresented minority students. And so it, we're not, we haven't gone far enough yet there. We've got to do more. and that. In STEM in general, 
STEM is terrible at this. Uh, and so we've, we've got to become more of a leader. We've got to do better. We've got to have more um, funds. So we need essentially full scholarships to compete for the best students. Um, uh, and because they're in really high demand and good for them, they can go anywhere. And uh, so we started the Great Mind Scholars Program a couple of years ago that's really aimed at, I mean, so here's the thing that gets to me, right? Right here in our backyard of Worcester, it's an incredibly diverse community. We should be having great students coming out of the Worcester Public Schools to WPI who um, you know, represent better the diversity of our community. And so we created the Great Mind Scholarship to do exactly that. And it's been growing slowly and um, we need to make it grow faster. But here's the thing, we can do all we want to increase those numbers. And if students are then walking into a culture that is not welcoming for them, that is not a place where they can thrive, that's not gonna work. So it's a both and. We've got, both gotta help the numbers, but we've also gotta help the culture. Thank you, Lori. Um, will it be possible for alumni to participate in an anti-racism series? What a great idea. Sure, let's do that. Love it. And I, I think it's a great idea. So I, I think that you, thank you, and I think that you, <laughs> Sort of answer yes. this this question, but I'm gonna. I'm, it's been so many questions in this in this um, area. Um, the questions are related to creating a diverse, equitable, and inclusive university. Can you share more of your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I'm um, one of the great things about working at NASA was that they took. I saw a world where um, the idea of diverse thinking uh, and diverse ways of solving problems and massive teams that were needed to do so wasn't just about, you know, oh, this is a good idea so we can get our rocket to the moon. They, they took it really seriously. And for, for me as a young manager there uh, 15 years ago, I remember going to my first training on white privilege in 2006 or something, right? And it was a revelation. I have to say it was. And it has driven me ever since to really um, work uh, on these issues in whatever organizations that, that I've been in. But I have to say academia is full of all kinds of privilege in ways that it, it has been very hard to grapple with. We are not nearly as good at this in academia as we are, as, as the government frankly was, which was heartening to me that the government was, was pretty decent at it. Um, and so, you know, there's something about the privilege of our, um, our system here in higher ed. And I'm, you know, I will say some of it I think has to do with the tenure system itself. And um, I think we need to be, to really confront that. I think that, um, okay, I'll probably get in really big trouble for saying this, nobody tweet this. Um, I think the tenure system has been really effective at perpetuating inequities. It's been really effective at protecting academic freedom, which is what it was built for. And, and I get that and that's really important, but it's also been great at perpetuating inequities, promoting people who look like the people who were already in it and, and excluding others and also at protecting a lot of bad behavior. And so I think we've got to face up to the fact that um, we have a lot of work to do in academia. This, that is part of the system that we have built that needs to change. And I'm not saying to get rid of tenure. I'm not saying that. That's not actually my perspective. But I am saying there are lots of things in our system that are pretty fundamental that we need to be able to confront in this fight. And I have been doing work very intensely actually for the last couple of years on thinking differently about um, sort of advancement, um, advancement, not like fundraising, but um, at, um, oh gosh, after three, after three town halls, my brain is dying, um, uh, about reward systems, that's the word I'm looking for, about reward systems in academia and how those drive behavior. And we've got a lot of work to do to sort of change some of the fundamentals here. Thank you, Lori. I'm going to turn a little different direction now. Uh, COVID-19 presents unique opportunities for research. Has WPI developed any plans to take advantage of these opportunities? Yes, yes, we have. Thank you for asking that. And I should have been smarter and included a slide about it. 
Um, so a couple of very specific examples and then more generally about where we're headed. So the very, I think the very first group that did um, the full genetic, I'm not gonna get it right, genetic analysis, some kind of big data analysis of the virus itself, that work was done at WPI by our bioinformatics group and made freely available to everybody who was looking at the 3D structure of all the proteins and things in the, in the virus. Um, Dimitri Korkin and his bioinformatics group did that. They basically dropped all their other research, worked for two weeks without sleeping, and got it out to the world. And it's, just it's been incredibly helpful to so many people. So that kind of research is happening. Um, also on the technology side, so Greg Fisher, professor of, of robotics engineering, when we all went to remote work, took a bunch of stuff home from his lab, which I don't recommend, but he did, he's a professor, okay. And basically in his garage built um, a relatively inexpensive ventilator concept, which is now being patented and, and being um, uh, shared uh, around the world. And so again, both on the technology side and the science side, our faculty are engaged. And then our wonderful provost, Wally Sobiejo, has convened a group of faculty that cut across science, engineering, and social science and humanities to really, and global studies, to really think about um, a more integrative approaches to fighting pandemics. They've also been working very closely with with um, people in different countries in Africa to help provide them with inexpensive solutions and community engagement strategies to fight COVID in Africa. There's a ton of things going on and I'm so incredibly proud of that work. Thank you. Um, this question, I think you touched on it in your talk, but it's come up a couple of times. How are applications to the incoming class and how is enrollment shaping up? Yeah, so I can give you more specifics. So we had um, more applications this year than we have ever had. We broke 11,000 for the first time ever applications for about 1,300 slots in the class. So we're, so it's darn good. Um, I will say it was an admission cycle unlike any admission cycle uh, in the history of ever because of the pandemic right in the middle of that moment when students are coming to campus by the hundreds, literally, to visit us and we had to cancel all those visiting days and pivot very quickly to a remote strategy, which we did and what it was excellent. I, I, I think we, we were held up somewhere as one of the very best on that. Um, and, uh, and so I, I'm very proud of the team and they worked really hard to bring in the class and we were able to do it. I will tell you, we have some insider info about others and, and we have outperformed our peers. Now it's a question of keeping them, right? And so, so much of what I've just spent the last two days doing with, with students is trying to convince them that on the one hand, it's gonna be safe for you to come back, safe. On the other hand, it's not gonna suck, right? I'm <laughs> sorry, that's probably getting a little too blunt. It's not gonna be awful, um, that, that we will still have a good student experience for you. That's a tough balancing act. You've got everybody, the whole range of emotions, right? Some people are like gung-ho to come back, let's do it tomorrow, and oh, by the way, I don't wanna wear a mask or do anything. Others saying, I'm really nervous, I'm really scared, I'm married, you know, I'm a faculty or staff member, I am married to someone with an immunocompromise, I, I, a student who has a pre-existing condition. And so again, we're trying to be flexible enough to accommodate all of these things while um, bringing our community back to the extent that we can. But there's gonna be real restrictions on it around things like big events. And so unfortunately, so many of the things that we typically do with alumni, we're, we're trying to, gonna try and get as creative as we can, but I'm really glad to see the Zoom platform working for us because that might be a lot of what we do at least for the, for the coming few months and we'll see if it gets better after that. Thanks, Lori. Time for one more? Sure. Okay. Um, how can alumni help with recruitment for WPI, supporting WPI during COVID-19, and just in general? Oh, so an easy one to finish with. Well, um, so first of all, just by participating in this meeting, you're helping us. By, uh, by being a part of the conversation, you're helping us. Um, by talking up WPI in your local communities, by following us on social media and retweeting and reposting to your communities, by by you know, engaging and, and, and talking about WPI, by engaging with us on the TechConnect platform. We do have, is it right, Peter, that we do have opportunities there for, for alumni to connect with students? 
Absolutely. Yeah, so Tech Connect is a great, uh, a great way for you to be involved. And then if you want to help us with co in COVID, we have an emergency assistance fund. If you go to give to WPI, that money is being given away in like thousand dollar chunks to um, to students in need. Uh, you know, we need scholarship money in this moment. We are expecting we've set aside several million dollars in this year's budget. We're expecting a lot of financial aid appeals for families who have had financial hardship as a result of COVID. We could definitely use um, alumni help with that too. So supporting scholarships, supporting our emergency assistance fund, all of those things would be, um, I would personally be incredibly grateful. But mostly just be a proud WPI alum, hold us to account to make sure that we, um, we are following through on the commitments we're making and, um, and keep doing great work out there in the world. And thank you. I, so many of our alums are, I mean, the CEO of Quest, for goodness sakes, is a WPI alum. I mean, they're, we're, we're right on the front lines of this fight against COVID. And uh, because of the wonderful group of alumni who have already provided input, we're going to be right on the front line of the fight for racial justice, too. So thank you all for that. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks, everybody. I, uh, I really appreciate everyone being here. And uh, if there are additional questions um, that we didn't get to or something we can work on trying to get folks answers to those. So again, everybody have a good night. Uh, thanks for participating and uh, stay safe, everybody. Bye.